Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Professor. Okay, good. Then I can get started then. Um, I just have to figure out how to shrink this. Um, so we start out today with uh, a continuation of our total internal reflection. Okay, so the last lecture we covered TIR. TIR stands for total internal reflection. And this we essentially deduce from a Fresnel reflection coefficient. We found that uh, the Fresnel reflection coefficients are that RTE is actually something like, um, let me see what notation I use, okay. Uh, beta 1z over mu 1z, uh, mu 1, sorry, just mu 1, minus beta 2z over mu 2 divided by beta 1z over mu 1 plus beta 2z over mu 2. And then TTE is one plus RTE, which will be just a two times beta one Z over mu one divided by the same denominator, beta one Z over mu one plus beta two Z over mu two. Okay, these are the Fresnel reflection coefficient for TE polarization. And then for TM, Paul, this is uh, TE for TM Paul. Uh, we just use uh, duality principle. Of course, when you apply duality principle, you should do the swapping E equal to H, H goes to minus E, and then you swap the material, mu goes to epsilon, epsilon goes to mu. Okay. And uh, if you go through the thought processes, then the RTM would be very much looking like above, okay? Uh, beta 1z over epsilon 1 minus beta 2z over epsilon 2 divided by beta 2z over epsilon 2. And then TTM would be the same thing, two beta one Z over epsilon one divided by both beta one Z over epsilon one plus beta two Z epsilon two, okay? So we will have total internal reflection with this coefficient if beta two Z becomes imaginary, okay? So if we were to say, add a new slide here, Get rid of this. Let me see if I can make this bigger. So if if we have a total internal reflection such that beta two z, which is given by beta two square minus beta x square, okay, becomes pure imaginary. And this happens if beta x is larger than beta two, then beta two z would be a number like minus j alpha two z. Okay, it becomes a pure imaginary number because when beta x is larger than beta two, this thing is negative. And you take a square root of a negative number, you get a pure imaginary number. And then if you go and look at the Fresnel reflection coefficient, and if we just look at RTE, for instance, uh, I think it, it will stay if we make it smaller. RTE, 
okay, RTE then would be equal to, if you look at this equation, would be of the form of uh, A minus an imaginary number of A plus an imaginary number divided by A minus an imaginary number, okay? And if that is the case, then, uh, if that is the case, then you immediately know that the denominator of this fraction or rational function, the denominator and the numerator are complex conjugate of each other. So if you take the magnitude of the complex number, it is always going to be square root of uh, a squared plus b squared half, okay? That is how you take the magnitude of a complex number, which means that the magnitude of RTE would be <coughs> a plus jb divided by the magnitude of a minus jb, and it will always be equal to one. What it means is that the power, the to total power of the incident wave will be completely reflected. Okay, this is known as total internal reflection. And that also can happen for both TE and TM polarization, because when you look at the TM polarization, uh, when beta 2z becomes pure imaginary, it also is of the form of <coughs> A minus JB divided by A plus JB, and RTM would also have the magnitude of one. So the question to ask is, when would this B on the second part of the numerator become a pure imaginary? So in order to see this more clearly, we can use a, a face matching diagram. Okay, this is just a face matching diagram. And this diagram, I took it out of Kong's book. So the notations are not quite correct compared to my lecture notes. Okay, because in my lecture note, this will be the z-axis, this will be the x-axis. But in Kong's book, uh, they are also labeled in the reverse fashion. And in Kong's book, um, they use k. So I'm going to use beta in my lecture notes. So k and beta can be assumed to be interchangeable, okay? So now if you assume that you have an incident wave vector k, incident from medium zero, okay? And then there will be a <coughs> transmitted wave vector kt. Okay, this is the transmitted wave vector kt, incident wave vector k. And there will be a reflected wave vector case of t. And all these wave vectors have the property that their magnitude kt square is equal to ktx square plus kt uh, z square has to be equal to k2. If I call this medium 2 or medium kt, kt square, and then in medium one, the left medium, then k, if I use k1 square, the magnitude of k1 square should be k1x square plus k1z square. And this should be equal to k1 square. What it means is that the vector will have the same length, no matter what direction it is pointing in medium one, but in the other direction, it will also have the magnitude of kt, uh, irrespective of what direction the wave vector is pointing. And by looking at this diagram, these two vectors have to have phase matching conditions satisfied, which means that the z component in this picture, the x component have to be equal to each other. So we have drawn the k vector in such a way that the x component or the z component uh, matches up with each other. And this is how you, <coughs> this is essentially just snail's law. These diagrams, these k vectors have been drawn in such a fashion that 
their KZ or KX components are matched up with respect to each other. And, can, and then you can see that Snell's law apply. The incident angle has to be the same as the reflected angle. And if you were to project out the, the Z component or the X component of this K vector, it should be equal to the other K component. But the K, uh, K vectors are of different lengths. Okay, the K vector is of this length in medium two or medium T, and K vector is of medium, uh, is of this length in medium one. Okay, uh, so depending on the medium you are in, the K vectors will have different length, and in this medium, I'll assume that KT is larger than K zero. Okay, KT is larger than K zero, and there's no total internal reflection for this picture over here for this face matching diagram. But if I do the opposite, okay, where I assume that KT is less than K0. Okay, this is K0 here. And this is KT on this side. Then the K vector on the KT side should be falling on the tip. Or the tip of the K vector should be on this circle. Whereas on the other <coughs> side, the tip of the K vector depending on what direction they are pointing, should be on this other circle, okay? However, in order to satisfy the phase matching condition, the Z component of these K vectors have to be the same. And so this is a scenario where the Z component of K vectors will be the same, that this incident K vector is being reflected, or the wave has been reflected producing a reflected K vector, and then the transmitted K vector is horizontal. Okay, the K vector is horizontal. And then you can see that the Z components of these three K vectors are the same as each other. Okay. And the wave is horizontal. What does it mean? It means that there's no transmitted wave in this case. And if you try to go any bigger, if this incident angle becomes bigger and say if it increases angle in this direction, Okay, then there's no K vector in region T that can match the incident K vector. Okay, however, KZ is the same in both regions in this picture, which Im implies that KTZ will, in this case, will be KT square minus KZ square in this picture. Okay, K. Uh, K, sorry, it should be KTX squared. KTX in this case. And if this KZ is going to be larger than KT, okay, by increasing this angle, you will see that KTX has to be evanescent. KTX becomes pure imaginary. Okay, so this phase matching diagram quickly allows you to decide what the critical angle or the angle of total internal reflection is. The angle at which this other vector starts to be horizontal, this is called a critical angle. Okay, beyond that, the wave becomes evanescent in the other direction or in the other medium. Is this clear? Are there any questions regarding this? Okay, so, so when this happens, we have total internal reflection. And what happens is that, um, say if I take the RTE case, it will be beta one Z divided by mu one minus beta two Z divided by mu two over uh, beta one Z over mu one plus beta two Z over mu two. And then this will be A minus JB over A plus JB, for instance, if one of these becomes a pure imaginary number. And this has magnitude of one, but you can also figure out what the phase should be. A minus JB, if you were to write in the polar form, would be the magnitude of A minus JB times the up tangent of b over a okay because this is a complex number that if this is real this is imaginary 
this complex number is pointing somewhere. It has the real part, which is A. It has an imaginary part, which is B. Okay, and then this angle theta, okay, the angle theta would be equal to up tangent of B over A. Okay, so that's how I get that phase. So if you were to work this out, RTE, it will always have the magnitude of one, and then it will be equal to uh, e to the minus two j up tangent of b over a. Okay, so this reflection coefficient has a magnitude of one, but it has a phase shift. And this phase shift is called the goose tension phase shift. So this is a phaser, a phaser having a phase shift. And if you have a phase shift in the frequency domain, what does it correspond to in the time domain? Does anybody know? A phase shift in the frequency domain is equivalent to what in the time domain? You might have learned uh, this from your other this near system theory course. Anybody wants to give an answer? What is the physical Should be mean? a time delay? Yes? Should be a time delay? Uh, yes, it would be a time delay in the time domain, okay? But actually, you're correct, your answer is correct, okay? That is, if we are working with the, yeah, let me put on my earphone. That is, okay, and I just changed my earphone so that I can hear you better. So, but we are working with, um, yeah, you're correct. It's a time delay. Okay, sorry about that. It's a time delay. <clears throat> so in the, in the frequency domain, we have this kind of thing. And then it would go to uh, a time delay. Okay, if you have something that have a phase shift, the phase will be added to this thing. It will give a time delay of some sort. Okay, when you take it back to the time domain. So if you were to look at this goose henshin shift as to what it would do to an optical pulse or an acoustic pulse, you'll find that the incident wave would come in this way, but it will not immediately be reflected if there's no phase shift in the reflection coefficient. What happens is that the wave will creep along the surface for a little while before it comes back at you to give you the necessary time delay in getting to you. So if you're observing the field over this part of the wall or the, or the space, we see that the wave does not immediately get to you by the, lean, uh, the shortest line of flight. It's instead, the wave comes in, creep along the surface, and then comes back at you, okay? And some people call this the, the creeping surface wave. Okay, and what is special about the creeping surface wave is that in region two, the medium is evanescent. As you see, okay, in region two, the wave is evanescent because the KZ or KX in this picture is uh, purely imaginary, or one of these betas becomes purely imaginary implying that the wave is evanescent because the wave in region two is of the form of minus j beta 2zc, okay? And when beta 2z becomes imaginary, this just becomes uh, alpha 2zc, okay? Which means that the wave becomes exponentially decaying in the second region. And so if you were to observe this wave, from this side is exponentially decaying. That wave is also called the evanescence wave. And it is exponentially decaying. From that surface because of the fact that the angle of incidence is larger than the critical angle. Any questions so far regarding this uh, boost tension shift and the 
physics of a total internal reflection. This is TIR. Any questions? Well, TIR has many users. Uh, okay, I actually should have put that as the first slide. One way to use TIR or total internal reflection is to make a waveguide. Say if you have a optical thin film being etched on top of a substrate and that if you have the medium such that this medium is optically more dense than this medium. In other words, if I make sure that uh, if this is C, if I make sure that K uh, of the firm is larger than KC, and then K of the firm is larger than KS, the substrate. You can also use beta. Beta and, and K are interchangeable in this course, okay? And if that happens, what it means is that total internal reflection can happen at these two interfaces. And you can find an angle for the wave propagation so that TIR happens here and TIR also happens here. And then there's no energy loss because the wave will be evanescent outside, will be evanescent outside. And the wave is bound and it keeps bouncing back and forth between these two Wave. This is called a bouncing wave. It's also bound. Okay, the the bound here is quite different from bouncing. Okay, it's bound by the fact that the wave is evanescent in both the transmitted and the reflected region, and the energy is confined <coughs> in this uh, thin film. Okay, this one thing you can do, and another thing that you can do is actually to make an optical fiber. If you have an optical fiber, uh, if you make the refractive index of the fiber such that this thing is optically more dense than the cladding, then there will be total internal reflection happening at this interface. And then the light wave will be bound to the core of this fiber. Uh, it can actually travel long distances with very little loss, okay? So Charles Carr, who invented the optical fiber in 2000, I think he did the work in the 1970s or 80s, and then he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2009 for inventing this optical fiber, okay? So where else can you see total internal reflection in your everyday life? Does anybody want to suggest a place where you can see total internal reflection? Uh, I actually saw it when you see from beside the uh, from uh, uh, behind the surface of uh, water. You, uh, under a certain certain angle, you cannot see anything but the reflection from the surface of water. That's right. So if if any one of you is a swim, swimmer, okay, if you're in in a swimming pool, okay, if you're swimming down here. Okay, and if you look up, you will see that at a certain angle, you will only see, there are only a certain cone where you can see light ray coming from outside, okay? You will see that if right, light rays coming from the outside, they would be refracted at this angle into this cone, and you will only see things from the outside in this cone, and then for the other angle, you actually see reflection of the bottom of the swimming pool, okay? You will see a mirror. So unfortunately, we cannot swim anymore because of COVID-19. But if you do have a chance to go back to the swimming pool again, if you dive under and look at this, you will see this very interesting total internal reflection phenomenon uh, for certain angle, okay? Okay, any other questions regarding this? Let me put in auto save to be on. Okay, then, then we will move on to other interesting phenomenon that we can find with uh, a single interface problem. Okay, let's see what else we can study. 
So the next thing I like to talk about is actually the Brewster angle. Brewster angle. Yes. Somebody say something. Okay. Uh, do you want to say something? Somebody mumble something. Brewster angle is something interesting that happens to mainly TM polarization. The reason is because for the TM reflection coefficient, there's an extra term which is replaced by epsilon one, epsilon two here, and then uh, then the other one would be beta one over epsilon one plus beta two z over epsilon two. Okay, it turns out that most materials are non-magnetic. Okay, so RTM is that, but RTE is is given by this. Okay, but most materials are non-magnetic such that mu1 equals mu2. Okay, mu1 equals mu2, then this cancels away. So the TE reflection coefficient behaves quite differently from the TM reflection coefficient. And it turns out that RTM is equal to zero if beta 1z over epsilon 1 equals beta two z over epsilon two. And this is possible if epsilon one is not equal to epsilon two. And that kind of materials happens all the time. Okay. However, RTE is equal to zero if beta one equal to beta zoo, two z. Okay. Because mu one and mu two are equal to each other. This is not possible. These two numbers cannot be each equal to each other if beta one and beta two are different. Okay, because you remember that beta i z is square root of beta i squared minus beta x squared. So if the beta i's are different, they cannot cancel each other. They cannot be equal to each other. So that's give us an opportunity for something called Brewster angle when these two numbers are equal to each other. And so you can work out the criterion for that quite easily. Okay. The criterion would be that beta one Z over epsilon one equal to beta two Z over epsilon two. And then you can actually use the fact that, uh, as I mentioned before, beta I Z is given by this. Okay. You, beta I Z is given by this. You can swap, uh, square that equation and solve for your beta x. Okay, you can solve, square the equation. You get beta one square minus beta x square over epsilon one square equal to beta two square minus beta x square over epsilon two square. And from this equation, you can solve for your beta x very easily. I would just go straight to the answer and not go through the detail with you, but I'm sure that you can do this at home. It's not too difficult. And I'm going to assume that mu1 equals mu2. Okay, and you can find that this is your solution. Mu1 equals mu2 equals mu. I'm assuming that the material is non-magnetic. Okay, so you can work this out. Uh, beta x in this case would be equal to by Snell's law of phase matching beta1 sine theta one, okay, is equal to beta two sine theta two, because if you have this medium, uh, like if this is the z axis, this is the x axis, and if this thing is coming in like this, then beta x are equal to each other by phase matching. The, have to have the same beta x component and you can work out the beta x component using this equation. And then this might be theta one and this might be theta two. 
and theta 1 and theta 2 are related to each other by Snell's law or phase matching law. Okay. And you can easily hence plug into the above equation and figure out that sine theta 1 is equal to square root of epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2. Okay, you can plug this in and cancel the, uh, the omega mu epsilon from one side and then you can figure out that sine theta 2 is equal to epsilon 1 over epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2. It's quite straightforward, just plug it in and compare. And you find that say sine theta 1 and sine theta 2 are equal to that. And it's quite clear that sine square theta 1 plus sine square theta 2, if you square this equation and square that equation, you will get epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2, which is equal to 1. Okay. But we also know of another identity that sine square theta 1 plus cosine square theta 1 must also be equal to 1. So what this equation implies is that sine square theta 2 must be equal to cosine square theta 1. Well, if you keep everything between 0 and 90 degrees, this means that sine theta 2 is equal to cosine of theta 1. Okay. And what this means is that uh, you remember that you can also convert this into a sine by saying that this is just pi over 2 minus theta 1. I'm sure that this is the right thing. And then from this equation, you claim that uh, if these are equal to each other, then theta 1 plus theta 2 must be 90 degrees. Okay, so when total, uh, when Brewster angle happens, when Brewster angle happens such that there's no reflection, the reflected wave is zero, the two angles, theta 1 and theta 2, must add up to 90 degrees, okay? Any questions so far regarding the derivation? If not, then how do we represent this pictorial, okay? I'm again taking a picture from Kong's book, okay? He used a k uh, vector to represent thing, and then he used x and z axis differently. But the story is simple. The story is simple which means that the incident angle theta 1 plus theta 2 must be pi over 2. So which means that this angle plus this angle must be 90 degrees, or this angle plus this angle must be 90 degrees, which means that this angle is 90 degrees. Okay, so that angle is 90 degrees. Pictorially, you can see something very interesting. Very interesting in the sense that if you think of this as a TM polarization, the TM polarization, the magnetic field is coming out of the paper. The H is coming out, the E field is coming out like this. Okay, this is what the TM polarization is. Electric field is actually in the plane of the paper. Okay, the electric field or plane wave enters the medium. The electric field is still in the plane of the paper magnetic field is coming out of the paper. Okay, the K vector is pointing in this direction. These are plane waves. And you can see that the polarization of the electric field is always parallel to this reflected K vector. What does this mean? Well, this means that there's no radiation in that direction. The reflected wave is zero in that direction and you can give that a very different physical explanation. And I'm going to actually come to this explanation heuristically by saying that if you have a dipole, and many of you have done the exercise of a dipole, the electric field looks something like this for a dipole. Okay, so this electric field is polarized like this and there will be many dipoles P, which is proportional to chi E in this medium. And those will be polarization current. And this polarization current will give rise to little dipole densities which are supposed to radiate. And if you look at the radiation property of the dipole, 
the electric field looks something like this. And the magnetic field would look something like this by Ampere's law. If the current is swapping back and forth in this dipole, then by Ampere's law, the magnetic field looks like this, okay? Magnetic field is horizontal. The electric field is vertical. And if you look at E cross H around this little dipole, because the magnetic field is radial, or sorry, the electric field is radial in top and the bottom direction. E cross H dot R is equal to zero. E cross H dot R is the pointing vector in the R direction, and they are always equal to zero in the two ends of the dipole. Hence, one thing you can conclude from this picture, heuristically derived, is that a dipole does not radiate in the end fire direction. This is called the end fire. So with this notion in mind, you have lots of dipoles being induced okay, by this wave, but all those dipoles do not radiate in that direction. And that is how some people explain that why at Brewster angle, there's no radiation of the field in that direction and hence there's no reflected wave, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so one other thing is that uh, because the TM reflection coefficient goes to zero and that the TE reflection coefficient doesn't go to zero, if you were to plot them, you'll find that the RTE magnitude is always larger than RTM, which means that the TE reflection coefficient is always larger than that of the TM reflection coefficient, okay? This gives rise to something very interesting uh, you observe in everyday life, which is that if you are a driver on the road or if you're a nighttime driver or whatever, you can make use of this uh, physical phenomenon to reduce road glare. Okay. Say, so how do we do that? What this means is that if you have a road surface, if the light is coming in like that, and you can think of the light has been randomly polarized, there will be one. Uh, component of the light is vertically polarized that you call the TE uh, TM polarization and then there will be a component of the light that is TE polarized which is horizontally polarized and hence any light that is coming in at the road surface can be broken up into TE and TM okay TE and TM and of these two polarizations of the light one of them will be more strongly reflected than the other one. So RTE will be strongly reflected, but RTM is less strongly reflected. So if you're over here, and if you open your eyes to look at the reflected wave, if the wave is randomly polarized, so that TE and TM polarizations are equally strong. So by the time that they reach your eyes, which polarization will be stronger, do you think? horizontal or vertical. Let's assume that one of these is horizontal. The other one is vertical, okay? So when you observe the reflected light of a road surface, which one would be a stronger polarization? I think it's one the TE polarization. The TE polarization will be stronger, right? Yeah. Because it will have a stronger reflection coefficient. So, most of the reflection from the road surface will be TE. Okay, so what you do is that if you go and buy sunglasses, make sure that you can buy sunglasses that block out the TE polarization or the horizontal polarization and only let the vertical polarization go through. Okay, and those are good sunglasses if you were to buy them. Okay. So next time if you shop for a sunglass, a pair of sunglasses at Walmart, make sure that this is true. But how would you test if your sunglasses are good for TE or TM or that they can actually 
choose to let in only the uh, vertically polarized light so that uh, TE light, which is horizontally polarized, cannot go through. How would you do this test if you are inside Walmart? Anybody? You could look at a phone screen. The, the, the phone screen? Yeah, the semi-polarized light. Okay, it could be true. I, I'm not sure uh, which polarization the light is coming out of your phone screen. But what um, happens if you don't have a phone? What would you do? I would put them uh, perpendicular to each other, take two and put them perpendicular to each other. And if they are polarized, linearly polarized, okay, uh, so there will be no light. Okay, very good. That's a very clever way. And what other ways can you test those sunglasses to see that they have a polarizer inside Walmart? What would you do? Anybody? Well, you can use the sunglasses that you have to look at the reflection of light off the floor of Walmart. And presumably you're not looking at the carpeted floor and many of the floors are tarred and they're very smooth surfaces. And if you rotate your sunglasses and looking at the reflected light from the floor of a shiny floor surface, you will see that if the sunglasses is polarized, then the reflection would be diminished depending on the angle of rotation. Okay, do you get that? Do you get that? Yes. I guess you, you get that, right, or, or, or not? Yes, you're right. And uh, we can rotate those glasses to see the, the reducing of light. Or... Okay, very good. Okay, I, I guess you catch my point. Okay, very good. And then if you're a photographer, you can add polarizers to your lenses. And here is an example of reducing surface glare using a polarizer. On the left, you see that there is a glare from this window. Okay, and by using polarizers in your lenses of your camera, you can reduce those surface glare and make the beautiful picture out of your, your photograph. Okay. Uh, any questions? Any questions regarding Brewster angle? Okay, then the next phenomenon that I'd like to talk about is actually the surface plasmon polariton. Uh, most textbooks will not approach this problem my way. Okay? Most textbooks will go through a lot of equations and tell you what the surface plasmon polariton is. But you can actually see this by staring at the reflection coefficient. Let me tell you how. Again, it is the TM polarization that matters. Okay, RTN. If I write it in a different way now, okay, I cross multiply and get the denominators to go away. I can also write the reflection coefficient in this manner. Okay, and it turns out that the denominator of this reflection coefficient can go to zero. Say if I have an interface, epsilon one and epsilon two. And if epsilon two is negative, which happens say if you have a plasma medium, okay? If this is a negative number, then there's a chance that this number will cancel this number. Okay, the second number is positive, first number is negative, and then the denominator will go to zero. And that happens when you have a surface plasmonic mode. Okay, so let's look at this equation more carefully. And, uh, and if you look at this, this would happen when epsilon two, uh, beta one z. Um, is equal to epsilon beta 2c, okay? And then you can actually look at this again, but then it actually is almost the same as the Brewster angle. This is surface plus one polariton. The Brewster angle one is epsilon two beta one z is equal to epsilon one beta two z. This is Brewster. Okay, 
So in order to solve for the roots of this equation, you have to square it. The two equations are actually the same. When you square it, you get epsilon two square beta one z square is equal to epsilon one square beta two z square. And we already solved this equation before in the previous slide when we did Brewster angle. And we went through the solution in this thing. And then, so the equations are actually the same. They are actually exactly the same. You can actually look for the surface uh, polaricon mode and you'll find that well, um, let me see. Let me take it out of the paper. Uh, you will find that uh, the equations are the same, except that you have to be careful about the sign. So the equations are exactly the same as those you have in Brewster angle. But the trick here is that epsilon two is a plasma medium, so it can be it can be a negative medium. That is what makes it different. Okay, epsilon two is negative, but if epsilon two is negative. If you take a square root of a negative sign, a number, you get a pure imaginary number, and beta x would be pure imaginary. That's no good. Beta x is the wave number in the x direction. Remember, we have this thing. We have uh, incident wave. We cannot wave. hear you, Professor Chu. Oh, you cannot hear me. Uh, let me check. Uh, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you too. Yeah. Can you hear me now? I can hear. Yeah, I, I, I checked the internet connection. It says it's okay, it's strong. Uh, let's wait a little while. Maybe there's some date period. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, so if you hear me now, I'll continue with the lecture, which means that uh, remember in our coordinate system, this is the z direction, this is the x direction, okay? Beta x is given by this number, you can solve for it, it's the same equation as you have for Brewster angle, but then epsilon two is negative. So, but if epsilon one plus epsilon two is also negative, epsilon two is so negative such that even though epsilon one is positive, okay, even if epsilon one is positive, then the, both the denominator and the numerator are negative and then beta x will be pure real. And that can happen. That can happen such that beta x is pure real, but epsilon two is negative, okay? And that is when you have the reflection coefficient going to infinity. What does it mean when the reflection coefficient becomes infinitely large? Does anybody want to offer a physical phenomenon? Reflection coefficient equals to infinity. What does it mean physically? It will take a while to, to contemplate to find out what the, the physical meaning is. When the reflection coefficient is infinite, what it means is that uh, if you have an incident wave, okay, what it means is that this is a TM polarization. So RTM times H incident, is good to H reflected, okay? Uh, so this becomes infinity. And what that means is that you can have no incident wave. And then H reflected is finite. That's what it means. Zero times infinity is undefined. You are free to choose any value that you want, which means that you can have a reflected wave even when there's no incident wave. That's what it means when you have a reflection coefficient that's infinite, okay? Does this make sense to, to anybody or everybody? The reflected wave is finite even though you don't have an incident wave. 
What it means is that you have a surface here. There's no incident wave, but there's a reflected wave at the surface, or maybe even a transmitted wave, okay? So this is the case of resonance. I can give you an example of resonance, which is that of a tank circuit. Uh, a tank circuit is such that when you have a driving source, you will have currents and flowing in, uh, currents and voltages in a tank circuit. But if you switch it off, okay, you can still have non-zero current and flowing, uh, current and voltage flowing in a tank circuit. Why does that happen? That can only happen if the current and the voltage are at the resonant frequency of the tank circuit. So no driving source, but the solution is non-zero. The same thing happens here. No driving source. This is a driving source. This is a driver. Okay. The driver is zero, but yet there is a solution. That is the same sort of, uh, situation here. I can switch off this voltage. Okay. And I will still get the solution there. And there are many examples of this in our engineering practice. That is, uh, when you have, say, uh, this equation that you have is probably uh, I is uh, omega. No, it's, it's not. Um, I think it's something like this, okay? Uh, if you have a tank circuit, if you write down the equation like this, it is a second order ODE. And if you have a driving source, it might be something like the T squared I is good LC I plus a source, okay? You switch this to zero, and yet you can have a solution. And that solution is called a homogeneous solution because I can write this as Okay, uh, let me see if I get my signs correct. Okay, uh, this is omega squared. This is this should be a minus sign here. This should be a minus sign. So this is a second order ODE. And when you turn the source off, uh, I still have a solution. What kind of solution do you call that for, for an ODE when there's no driving source? Does anybody remember if you have had a course in ordinary differential equation and when there's no source on the right hand side of the ordinary differential equation, you find those solutions. What are, what are those solutions? Does anybody remember? Uh, a homogeneous solution. Very good, homogeneous solution. Yeah, that's okay. also called like uh, solutions uh, to eigenvalue problem for this operator. Um, well, uh, not exactly, but let me let me explain to you later. These are called homogeneous solutions. So, back in the background, we're actually looking for the homogeneous solution of this problem. And when you look for the resonance solution, they're actually looking for the homogeneous solution. You also encounter this kind of problem a lot in matrix theory. AX equal to B. And if there's no driving term, then you essentially solve this equation. And if you solve this matrix equation without the driving term, what kind of solution do you call those? Does anybody, if you have had a course in matrix theory, this is an ordinary matrix equation that you solve, but when there's no driving term, you just solve an equation like this. What kind of solutions do you call those in matrix theory? Well, have you heard of the null space solution? Anybody? Yes, I've heard about it. Yeah, so when you don't have a driving term in the matrix theory, those are called a null space solution. Null space solutions, homogeneous solutions, and resonance solutions are all the same thing. Okay, so we are encountering a resonance solution in this uh, thing, and those are called the surface plasmonic modes. And 
and when you study that more carefully, you'll find that you can have, even if you don't have an incident wave, there will be a mode guided on the surface and it will propagate by itself, very much like a resonance circuit. And I will sketch out more detail in the lecture note. You'll find that this wave is evanescent in both directions, okay? And it is actually a wonderful phenomenon. I think I want to move on to something else, okay? I want to move into something called the homomorphism of uniform plane wave and transmission line equation. And, uh, and what I'm trying to say here is that uh, we have studied transmission line theory. It is very simple. Okay. And we have studied uh, plane wave reflection. And I guess all of us would agree that it's very complicated. It makes life very miserable for you. Okay. You have to worry about the polarization, you have to break it into TE polarization, TM polarization, you have the mesh boundary conditions. You have to go through jumping a lot of hoops to get the reflection coefficient. RTE is equal to blah, blah, blah. And then RTM is equal to blah, blah, blah. And then TTE is equal to that. And we jump a lot of hoops to find those reflection coefficients, whereas those reflection coefficients are quite easily found in transmission line theory. So it would be good for us to find a connection between transmission line theory and plane wave reflection. It turns out that there is a relationship and we will call this homomorphism. The underlying equation for this problem where I have a transmission line connected by a junction Z01, Z02. The underlying equation for these two problems are actually analogous to each other and I will use the mathematical term homomorphism. Okay, hence if I can map the first problem to the second problem and vice versa, I can use all the knowledge that I have found in solving the transmission line problem to solve the single interface reflection problem. That is the idea behind this. Okay, let me go through the math. Okay. So how do I make Maxwell's equations again look like transmission line equations, okay? And using uniform plane wave, for uniform plane wave, uh, I can replace my del operator with minus j beta, okay? That is what we did. And then Maxwell's equations becomes beta cross E equals to omega mu h. And then I have the second Maxwell's equations, which is Ampere's law becoming uh, minus omega epsilon e. And these two equations still do not look very much like transmission line equations. So I cannot use transmission line theory to solve these two equations yet. But let me look at these two equations for a simpler variety. Like uh, we consider TE wave first, TE pole. And when we consider TE pole in our problem, we always have Z something like this, X something like this, and then the electric field is pointing out of the blackboard or the paper, okay? Then E cross H, H is pointing, um, let me see, E cross H. Um, let me see, where did it go? I hope it didn't disappear. On me, okay. Uh, e cross H, uh, I guess H is pointing that direction, is correct. And K is pointing in this direction, or the beta is pointing in that direction as well. Okay, this is a TE polarization. And when we say TE, we always means transverse electric, but it's also transverse electric to Z. Sometimes we would use this notation TE to Z. Okay. And then let's assume that the electric field, X is pointing there, Y is pointing out, 
okay, of the paper. And let's assume that the electric field is pointing in the y direction only for this polarization. And then the magnetic field, of course, would have both x and z component. Z, uh, let me see, electric field, magnetic field would have z and x component. Okay, magnetic field is in the plane of the paper. And then I can rewrite my equations that I have previously, the equations that I have written down over here. Okay, for this TE polarization, having only this field components. And if I do that, then uh, I find that, um, well, uh, beta Z EY, must be equal to omega mu hx. Okay, that is if you were to look at this first equation. Okay, if I put in only ey here, and beta is pointing in this direction, beta is my k, okay, beta and k are equivalent. I always confuse because uh, k and beta are interchangeable in my research. Okay, so, so if I were to plug in beta, in this equation and assume that E is polarized in the y direction, then beta is pointing in the x and z plane. I find that my h will have both z and x and on the right hand side, if I write it out, okay, uh, I wouldn't have any z component because uh, beta cross E will only point out of the paper. Beta is in this direction, this is my beta crossing with E will only point out of the paper. So on the right hand side, I only have HX and there's no HZ. Okay, let me see if I'm saying it right. Z cross Y, uh, Z cross Y is equal to HX. Okay, so, so essentially I want to work out this equation in detail. Okay, and if we plug in the z component here and plug in the y component here, and then the right hand side should only give me the x component. That's what I'm trying to say here. Okay, the y component crossing with the z component will only give me the x component. So I have one equation. Okay, and then if I look at the other component of this equation, if you look at the other component of this equation, I will find that beta x. EY is equal to omega mu uh, HZ. Okay, Z cross Y should be X, so there should be a minus sign here. X cross Y is zero, is Z. So I'm just writing this equation two times, one to give me that component, the other time to give me that component, okay? Then I would look at the second equation that I have which is this bottom equation here, okay? Now, if I assume that my E on the right-hand side is pointing only in the Y direction, okay, let's see what I would have. I would have beta Z HX minus beta X HZ is equal to minus omega epsilon EY. Okay, in other words, I take this second equation that I have, which is this equation over here. Uh, maybe I can even write it down here. See if it doesn't go away. I guess it goes away. Uh, beta uh, cross H, oh. Make it smaller. Make it even smaller. Okay, beta cross H um, is equal to minus omega epsilon E. If I look at this second Maxwell's equations, which is from Ampere's law, and take the Y component of this and extract the Y component from this cross product, okay, my Y component from this cross product will be Z cross X and X cross Z, okay. 
I will have this equation over here, okay? But uh, these equations are not yet like transmission line equations because I have three variables here. I have, if I look at this equation, this equation and this equation, they're not like transmission line equations yet. Transmission line equations have only two variables, but of these three equations, I have three variables or three unknowns, hx, and then I will have hz, okay? I have hx, hz, and ey. There's too many for transmission line theory, and I like to eliminate one of them. How do I eliminate one of them? Let me assume that I do not like hz. I do not like hz and see if can eliminate it. And I look for an opportunity to eliminate hz. I can go back to my starting equation again. Okay, this equation says that hz can be expressed in terms of ey. Okay, and if I put hz in terms of ey, hz here can be written in terms of ey. And then I would have uh, two equations left with only two unknowns. And let's see if we can make that look like a transmission line equation. So if I do that to using this equation to eliminate hz, the third equation would become something like this, okay? Um, okay, the third equation would become something like this. I would have, let me see if I can make it smaller. Make it smaller even. How do I make it? All these big things uh, blowing up at the top there. I don't know why they become so big. Or maybe this one will make it smaller. Okay, it becomes smaller and then I can make my screen bigger. Okay, so I'm going to use the one of the three equations to eliminate hz, and then the third equation that I have then on the left-hand side would just become uh, beta z hx, okay, which is the first term here, is equal to omega epsilon ey, which is what I have on the right-hand side, uh, plus Beta x squared over omega mu e y. Okay, I'm just using the second equation over here to eliminate h z and plug into the last equation. Then this is the equation I have. Okay, and then if I write this in tandem with the first equation, if I write this in tandem with the first equation, I will have something that looks like. Uh, beta z e y is equal to omega mu h y. Okay, and I can write the second equation more concisely by factoring out my omega epsilon, one minus beta x square over beta square e y. Okay, when I factor out my omega epsilon, I would assume that omega mu epsilon is equal to beta square. I get this equation. Then now I have two equations and two unknowns. And it looks a lot more like the transmission line equation or the telegrapher's equation. Let's assume that uh, I can replace J beta Z with D D Z, okay? If you assume that you have a wave of this form propagating on a transmission line, then D D Z would just goes to minus J beta Z, okay? Everybody remember that. Now I can rewrite these two equations that I have in a way that they look like the transmission line equation. So the first equation, I can rewrite it as partial partial z uh, ey, I mean this equation, okay, uh, is equal to minus j omega mu h x, okay, plus j omega mu h x. And then the other equation, I can write it as partial partial z hx is equal to j omega epsilon cosine square theta ey. 
Okay, I'm going to rewrite this factor. 1 minus beta x squared over beta squared to become a cosine squared because beta x squared is essentially, uh, if you remember the tangent theory, this is just beta sine beta, right? If you remember, this is my x-axis, this is my z-axis, and this is my k vector, and then if I have an angle theta here, okay, if I have my angle theta here, okay, then beta x is actually just k or beta sine theta, okay, beta sine theta, and then if I plug that in here, this is just one minus sine theta becomes a cosine squared theta. So now these two equations look very much like transmission line equations of the telegraphers equation. And if I put them side by side for comparison, then the telegraphers equation will look something like this for the voltage. Okay, and then for the current, it will look something like this. This is what the telegraphers equations that we have learned. But we have two equations now that look strikingly similar to the telegraphers equation. So I just have to do a map. If I make EY to be the same as B, and then I make HX to be the same as negative current, I make mu to be the same as my inductance per unit length, and then I make epsilon cosine square theta to be the same as my capacitance per unit length, then these two equations are very similar. And I know that in transmission line theory, the characteristic impedance is L over C. And also over here, if I make this map, I will find that I will find a wave impedance, which is given by omega mu over uh, beta Z. Okay, if you do this map, and if you call this, uh, for instance, if you call this L, if you call this C, if you divide the two, uh, then you get omega mu over beta Z, okay? Uh, then you will get the fact that, uh, maybe, let, let me do the map properly. If I say Z naught is square root of L over C, which if I do this map will be the square root of uh, mu divided by epsilon cosine square theta. Okay. And then I can also write this as uh, equal to mu epsilon cosine theta. Okay, cosine theta is also equal to beta z. Okay, so I can also write this as z naught over mu epsilon uh, beta over beta z. Okay, I can write this as beta over beta z. And then beta is, is as you know, omega mu epsilon. Okay, so if I plug that in here, I will get, um, uh, let me see what I get. I will get omega mu over beta z. Okay. So I can do this and then I can map the transmission line problem uh, into a into a one junction transmission line problem. I can map a one junction transmission line problem into a single interface uh, reflection problem. Okay. And I just have to be mindful that when I have this characteristic impedance, I do the mapping properly. Okay, this will be omega mu one over beta one. Z zero two will be omega mu two over beta two. Because I find that the characteristic impedance maps to this thing which is called a wave impedance. Okay, these are called the wave impedance. And then 
we know that gamma one two for a single junction transmission line is zero two minus z zero one over z zero two plus z zero one. And now if you plug this in, you will get uh, exactly what you have seen before, which is mu two over beta two z. Okay, this so sorry, this should be a z here. Okay, this should be a z here. This should be a z here. Okay, you will get beta two z minus mu one divided by beta one z over mu two beta two z plus mu one beta one z. And you can re-manipulate this. And if you re-manipulate this, it will look exactly like what we have found before, okay? Over beta c over mu one plus beta t c over mu two, okay? So we have successfully done this for TE polarization. In a lecture note, I would teach you how to do it for TM polarization. And hence the TM polarization can also be mapped to a single junction transmission line problem. That is the intent of this lecture to show, to show you that there is a one-to-one -one homomorphism between these two problems, a single junction transmission line problem and a single interface plane wave reflection problem. I guess I'll stop here. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Uh, I have a question. Oh, sure. Uh, it's about the uh, Batek's uh, expression we have for, we had for surface uh, plasma and polaritons. So in the denominator, there's an epsilon one plus epsilon two term. So is it possible to get it to be zero and if so, what will, uh, how okay. will be the way that, that is a very good question, okay? We, I don't have time to discuss the detail of the physics of this, okay? So for the surface plasmonic mode, there's a chance for this to become zero. I say that it just has the negative for it to give a beta x that is positive or pure real. If it becomes zero, it means that beta x becomes very large. And when beta x becomes very large, what does it mean if a wave number becomes very large? Beta x is the wave number in the x direction. And if it becomes very large, what comes up to your mind when it becomes very large? Well, the wavelength is very, very short. Okay, so when you are close to the case where the, the, the thing like this goes to zero, the wavelength becomes very, very short in the X direction. And that is the case when you hit the plasmonic resonance. Beta X becomes very, very large and the wavelength becomes very, very short. And what is more important is that if beta X becomes very, very large, you also have another phenomenon that kicks in, which is the beta TZ, beta IZ. This beta I squared minus beta X squared. So if beta X becomes very large, the wave becomes strongly evanescent in both directions. So not only does the wave becomes very short, the wave also becomes strongly evanescent away from the interface. That makes the surface plasmonic mode tightly confined. You know what I mean by tightly confined? It means that all the energy of this mode is sticking to the surface very, very tightly. And that is something that you cannot achieve with any optical waveguide. If you have optical fiber, the energy is not tightly confined to the optical fiber. But if you have this surface plasmonic mode, you can have very, very tight energy confinement. And for a time being, uh, for a while, the optics people were really excited about this mode. Okay, because you can have very tight confinement, you can have very short wavelength, 
Uh, you can have even wavelengths much, much shorter than the wavelength of light. Okay, because there's no, there's no limit as to how beta x, how large it could be. It means that you can have a mode with very short wavelength and very tight confinement. Okay, I, I will, I'll write out more about this in the lecture notes and you can read about it. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? Um, I have one. Uh, when, you, uh, when you told about phase delay uh, for the full reflection, uh huh. Yes, that was when we had the goose henshin ship. Yes. Yeah, you talk about uh, some small depth into which uh, uh, wave can pen uh, which wave can actually penetrate. Does it actually have something to do with uh, uh, skin depth, or it's different? Uh, there's no skin depth here. The wave is evanescent, but it's not due to dissipation. It's due to the fact that the wave cannot penetrate inside. It's very much like a plasma medium. The same physics holds there because in a plasma medium, we have this case. This is a co collisionless plasma. Okay, when omega is less than the plasma frequency, epsilon becomes negative. But if you look at the pointing vector and the pointing power, there's no dissipation into the plasma medium because it is a co collisionless plasma. There's no way for energy to be dissipated. The same thing here happens if you are beyond the critical angle, the wave becomes evanescent on the other side. It is not, it is not due to dissipation. It is due to phase matching. Okay. And, and it's not the same as skin depth. It's very different physics from those of the skin depth. Okay. You can think about it. Uh, if you were to study the pointing power E cross H, you find that E cross H has only an imaginary part in this direction. You will have a real part in that direction, but it will only be purely imaginary, which means that it can only carry reactive power in the, in the vertical direction, but it can carry time average power in the horizontal direction. Okay, if you look at this more, more carefully. Yeah, I think, I think it would be good homework exercise for you to go through this uh, studying of the pointing vector, pointing theorem, and look at this evanescent waves and see how pointing theorem, pointing vector applies to them. And you can see very interesting physical phenomena. Okay, any other questions? If not, then I'll let you go then, okay? I'll let you go. Let me see.